Yo, this is your boy Gelligel. This is Common Conversations. Y'all know the deal. Everything under the sun, at the table, in the trash can. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to eat it necessarily if it came out of the trash can. I don't know. It might be good too. We're going to have a dope conversation. Missy, what's good? Hey, friends. Man, Missy's in the house with us. We're going to, I mean, I think we keep having all these great fun conversations, but they're really equity conversations. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to hopefully educate you, teach you how we do this thing, right? And be as controversial or less controversial as we possibly can be. But at the end of the day, hopefully we're informing you and on this journey of understanding how we build equity in our own community, you can take away uh, some ideas um, Mm -hmm. and begin to build equity in your community, right? Let's get it. Let's go. What you been up to? Friend, so much. I have a new job. Ooh, new jobs. Let's new go. Job. First first new job in 20 years. I was with the same agency for 20 years, but I am with the same program, still doing prevention work at the state level. And was with one job as long as I've been married. <laughs> a little easier to switch jobs than spouses, right? I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Let's get it. But it felt that like you. ending, you know, a marriage because it was so long. But you get more money? Uh, I did, but Let's, I know we're not supposed to talk about no, money in this no, world, not, but, but I did. Yeah, we got some. We got privileges. Exactly. Let's there go. Some good came with it, and I have a home office now. It's lovely. Everything is lovely. Uh, so you used to work in this cloud in the sky, right? Tell everybody where you used to work. At. Oh, I used to work at New Hope Services, <laughs> and now I work for Straight Path Consulting. So it's the I do consulting and training for the entire state of Indiana when it comes to healthy families. Let's scale up. Let's get it. So kind of the same space, just. Mm-hmm. New opportunity. Let's go. Everybody who's scaling up in the world, man, give yourself a pat on the back. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's make that bread. Live happy lives. So we've got um, John Edwards with us today, right? Did I say that correctly? Let's go. And we're going to have a conversation about community leadership yes. in Southern Indiana. And we're going to phrase it that way because it can get really confusing when we talk about who you work for and what you do in terms of the groundwork that you've been laying um, in the conversations of diversity, equity, inclusion. And you throw tomatoes at people. Is that correct? Did I hear that earlier? I, I do not throw tomatoes. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it would be fun to throw tomatoes. <laughs> so if anybody's got some tomatoes, uh, send them our way. And maybe the ones that don't harm people so John can have them to throw. Right? <laughs> I, I throw I throw when I facilitate programs, I throw these um, stuffed balls at people every once in a while. Sometimes the people who hire me like it and some people don't. But it is what it is. Missy. Friend. Let's go. Let's do it. Where are we going? We're going to talk to John. I want to know. I want John to tell us where we're going. John, take us on a on a journey. Tell yeah. us about you. Yeah, for sure. So I have a wild and crazy past. I have literally done pretty much everything you can imagine uh, doing in my professional life. It's been an amazing journey. Started out very, very small. I came from a town called Perryville, Kentucky, less than probably a thousand people. I grew up with uh, my mom and dad and brother, just a terrific family, super supportive, grew up in church. Um, so we uh, grew up Southern Baptist and Southern Baptist was the, uh, what we started as. So, you know, growing up in that space, it was very difficult as I started to come to the realization of who I was. Right. You know, figuring out that I'm a gay man and living in that space with my family, you know, was at first difficult, um, as it would be for any family, mm-hmm. you know, when you're adjusting and learning something new. But as time has went on, you know, I have the most amazing mom and dad That's that are, good. you know, wonderful. My dad is very faith heavy. Um, and it's one of the things that I love about my father the most is his devotion and his faith and what he follows. He's die hard, you know, does everything he can to empower himself. And that's one of the things that I took from my dad is, you know, that ability to believe in something and push. So growing up, went to high school, graduated high school, went to college, realized college was not for me. So I went to uh, beauty school actually awesome. became a hairdresser. Mm-hmm. And that was an interesting conversation when I came home that day and told my dad, oh, by the way, I'm leaving college to go to beauty school. <laughs> but, uh, you know, started working as a hairdresser. Just my business grew and grew and grew. Um, had a tremendous business for years. Then in roughly, I think it was like 2004, a couple of things happened. Number one, I started, I became an artist uh, with uh, L'Oreal. It was one of the brands under their professional um, product side and started traveling and teaching hairdressers. So how did that, first of all, let's talk. So your business yep. was like in small town Kentucky yep. and clientele yep. grew? Clientele grew to the point where I became noticed, you know, and it was actually a distributor who noticed me and then came to me and said, you're so talented. Why don't we try to get you in an artistic platform space? And I was like, Sure. You know, I mean, I'd never talked in front of a group of people before, never done that, but I was like, sure. And took 
a liking to it, like not just liking it from a perspective of being in front of people and having that ego of being like, oh my gosh, everybody's looking at me, but I was changing people's lives. Like I was teaching them skills that made them more money or made their life easier or whatever it may be. So thus began my love of development and education. So um, the second thing that happened in 2004, which we'll get into in a little bit, that kind of shifted my heart and my process was I had a childhood friend, uh, Jesse Valencia. We grew up together, kindergarten all the way through high school. We were involved in Cub Scouts, T-Ball, church RAs, you know, high school plays, the whole nine yards. Um, but he was murdered in 2004. Oh, my gosh. Um, so it was a shift for me. But the other thing that began to happen is coming out as a gay man at 18 and starting to live my truth and being super connected to who I was. This event then led me into seeing the world in a different way, that there were people out there that would harm other people because they're different or even you know don't agree necessarily with someone in their perspective that they would actually hurt or harm them or even lead to something like murder which shifted and changed me forever because at that point i still really wasn't brave enough at that point to really start like sharing my story talking about who i am where i came from the challenges that i overcame as a gay man growing up in small town Kentucky, moving into a space, you know, with something like L'Oreal, where immediately I'm traveling the US, I'm on every platform hair stage you can imagine, I'm shooting collections in New York with some of the most revered photographers that, you know, exist in the beauty space, and just shifted into this crazy different world. But that event shifted me into being more focused on how do I make an impact in the world and how do I change places to help people so that things of what happened to Jesse don't happen to others in the future? Did that also change the way you felt about your personal safety did, or how you saw the world when it came to a personal perspective? Absolutely. You know, when you first come out, it is a very immense process. It's you're constantly in fear of being alone. You know, your family leaving you, your friends leaving you, everything that you know then becomes different. And really what I learned in that specific experience is I had never thought that someone would do something so horrible to somebody else to keep them quiet about who they are. Okay. And so that's when I it opened up my perspective to, wow, that could have been me, right? It could have been any of us, but it could have been me in that right. situation. And so it then made me look at people a little differently, kind of step back from afar and be like, hmm, what's going on there? Uh -huh. kind of thing. Uh -huh. Be so, a little discerning about yep. who you approached and yep. what you did. And it also made me brave to oh. tell my story and to not worry that I'm going to offend or hurt someone by me just sharing my truth and who I am. Because I believe in sharing when you share truth as who you are as a person, it helps other people maybe see something maybe within themselves that they're like, you know, I never thought about that, but that's something that I should share with other people. When, when, when after Jesse, you know, passed or was murdered, you said you, you found, you found that brave space. Like, do you, can you do, remember that exact moment that you was like, mm, there's a ah there? Yeah. And I think it was, so the trial or, uh, so in the beginning, they didn't know who it was. And so it took them some time through collecting evidence and following leads and things like that to narrow it down. And really once that process of the court started, and then it started moving in a direction of, they were really starting to push that that's when that process came for me because when someone that you care about is murdered they don't have a voice any longer so you then have to be that person to be that voice for them and i saw all of jesse's friends that he had in college that were sitting on the stand and telling the story and what they knew and who he was and what was going on that's when i realized i need to be a voice for other people that maybe are sitting there going hmm, maybe i'm not brave enough yet but the more that I'm brave and I share my story and talk about it, the more that I've seen other people shift and change and be like, I can do that too. So something that could have made you fearful made you brave. Yes, correct. And it's, you know, it's something that truly changed me forever. And it's, you know, now as a almost 42 year old man, looking back on my life, you know, I probably have been a little bit quieter than what I should have been for years. And honestly, 
it's just because I was busy. I traveled all the time when I worked for L'Oreal. So I was never home. I was never in a space where I felt rooted in a place long enough to really be connected, to be able to share my story and encourage others to share their story so that it connects into the community because it's all of those stories that come together that root and make a community what it is. And moving here, which I know I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit. Sorry about that. But <laughs> well, I am curious about I, that part because you yeah. were with Royale. You were traveling everywhere, yep. Yep. but you ended up in Southern Indiana. Yep. So what, how'd that happen? So in 2013, I took a corporate job um, creatively building and working with uh, – the JCPenney Corporation. So when Ron Johnson left Apple as the CEO and went over to JCPenney, that's when I joined as the creative side. So we were creating all the creative content, developing the education for the stylist, doing all the imagery, PR work, anything you can imagine. We kind of did it all. Best experience of my entire life. Really difficult time to work for JCPenney, but really amazing for me personally. I got to do things like I got to go to California and work with celebrities. Um, I did the City Year event with Octavia Spencer and was able to like work on her hair a little bit yes. and talk to her and get to know her. I worked the red carpet at the Oscars what? doing like touch-ups and fun stuff. It was us and Sephora that were working together. So it was a really cool collective space. Um, so I got to have experiences like that, right? And then I think it was 2015, I left JCPenney, went back to L'Oreal as the director of education for the U.S. for Matrix Logics uh, Biolage. Um, so my job at that point was to empower educators to then go out and teach. I worked hand in hand with sales, marketing, digital, all components, research and development to bring products to the U.S., get them into the hands of hairdressers, and then, of course, sell them and, you know, get them out there. Um, but again, traveled everywhere amazing experiences. But the one thing that I found, and people ask me all this all the time, they're like, oh my gosh, that job was so glamorous. Like why? It is glamorous and it is a lot of fun, but you will wake up in a hotel one day in Idaho, no. right? And somewhere random. And you will go, where has the last 10 years of my life gone? Right? I've done all this cool stuff. I have this amazing resume, all these cool pictures, magazine articles, whatever. But like I had no connection to anywhere. So Right before, I, in working with JCPenney, they moved me from the central U.S. where I was to Dallas, Texas, and I took over the west, west coast. So at every, like, if you draw a line down the middle of the U.S., I took over everything in the west. Opened several uh, salon by, in, uh, the, the salon, the InStyle salon by JCPenney. Um, we opened several of those for, through the U.S. We had a partnership with InStyle Magazine in New York um, to do that. And it was through that experience that I just was like, I miss, you know, I, I lived in Texas. I lived in Dallas. I lived in the middle of the neighborhood. Completely different experience for me. Mm -hmm. But that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to experience it and see what it was like. And it was a lot of fun. But I had met someone here who, you know, I was getting into a relationship with and building that when I accepted this job and moved. So we spent a year apart uh, traveling back and forth uh, to see each other. And then I just, you know, was like, hey, I want to move back. So going back to L'Oreal, I was able to live wherever I wanted. So I moved back to not the Louisville side, which is where I lived before I moved on this side and just absolutely fell in love with Southern Indiana. The area, the life, everything was slower. Everything's cheaper. Taxes are better. You know, the yes, it is. Yes, it is um, cheaper. But through that, through that experience, I still was working for L'Oreal, still traveling. And the last year that I was there, I was gone for three months straight. I came home twice for a weekend, literally flew home on Friday, flew out Sunday night. And I just was like, I'm done. Like I'm done. Right. No more suitcases, no more hotels, no more Ubers, no more airplanes, nothing. Um, so my partner and I sat down, we talked about it and I was like, I'm, I'm done. So mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. decided that, you know, a month later, basically I gave my notice and a month later I was out and free. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes. um, but Throughout that process, it made me realize I knew nothing about Southern Indiana, nothing about it. And I wanted to figure out how can I get rooted and how can I fit in? How can I help? What can I do? And that's where I found Leadership Southern Indiana, which is who I work for now. Got you. And before we jump in there, I'm, yep. I'm curious, you know, as as a gay man in working for L'Oreal, right, in the oh. hair industry, you know, you drove up through the ranks, mm -hmm. right? Corporate America. You know, are, were there challenges? Were there stigma? I mean, I mean, I'm making an assumption, you know, coming, being in the fashion world, being in retail as a photographer, you know, you'll meet more folks who 
are gay, bisexual in that space who who can scale up. But I also know the stories too where some folks haven't been able to because they still in some norms didn't fit. Did you face any of that? It's it's interesting. Actually being from the South made it more difficult for me. At the time I had a really thick Southern accent. Did you? Uh, I did. And it was through like coaches that worked with us, presentation coaches, voice coaches, different people that came in to help us. I was able to kind of eliminate a little bit of that Southern accent and be a little more neutral. Uh, That was a huge part that I had to overcome because being from Kentucky, you know, I mean, I remember the first shoot that I, the first big national ad campaign I did, I walked in and like everybody there was like, where are you from? (laughs) And I'm like Kentucky. And and then they, you know, they kind of do the whole, Oh, that's cute. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I mean, I have, a business and a life just like everybody else and probably make just as much money as you do in my business. Uh Like, you know, but, um, it was a lot of that, but people have a misconception working in the beauty industry. They think it's full of a lot of gay men. Yeah. It's actually not at all. You know, L'Oreal is a, one of my favorite parts about them is they're a big one for women's empowerment. And so a lot of leadership and things that work in L'Oreal that work for L'Oreal are women you know, you still, you still have, you know, a lot of men as well too, but a lot of the men that are there are straight men. So, you know, there was a very small group of us that were gay men that were open and, you know, and L'Oreal's a super supportive company. Like they're very inclusive and very, you know, focus on, you know, making sure everybody feels included in that process, which is great, but it's just kind of wild that people assume that, you know, you walk into a room and there's a bunch of male hairdressers doing hair that they're like, oh, everybody's gay. Actually, not a lot of them are. There was actually very few of us that were gay. That's so, so interesting. It um, presents challenges, but also at the same time, it was what I will attribute to myself. One of the things I'm most proud of is I've always lived my life by a quote by Maya Angelou. They're never going to remember what you say. They're never going to remember what you do, but they're always going to remember how you make them feel. Mm-hmm. And I attribute that to why I was able to aggressively move up in L'Oreal as quickly as I did, because any place that I was, it was about, you know, touching other people in a way that when I left, they knew who I was. And every single time they would see me from that point forward, they knew who I was. So, yeah. So I find it so interesting that your accent, something that you had zero control over and probably not a lot of awareness of because it's just what you're steeped in, was a stumbling block. And that is true for so many pieces of identity, like our identity. We're steeped in that. That is who we are and often who we're surrounded by. And until you jump out of that, you have no idea that that's going to be a hindrance for you in your professional life. That is very interesting. And I can't tell if I think it's a shame that you had to lose that. Well, professionally, you know, I mean, you know, so talking about like somewhere like New Jersey, for instance, uh, there was a big hair show there called the Miliani Hair Show, right? And you go there and when you're in the thick of New Jersey and it's like hardcore New Jersey culture, you're this little country boy from Kentucky on a stage. They're like, what the heck is this person going to teach me? Right. And it's hard because they don't give you an opportunity or give you a chance necessarily. But then once they do, they're like, oh my gosh, you're really good at this, you know? And it's, they make that judgment based off of how I speak that I'm not intelligent, you know? And so it was really interesting. But, um, if I'm around my grandmother and my mom long enough, it'll come back really quick. But, you know, it's one of those things I just think is funny. But it was throughout my career that I worked on those things to make myself a little more neutral mm-hmm. in how I talk. I feel like there is a deeper message there in having to lose a part of your identity in order to climb. But also, again, being a part of yourself that's just so intrinsic that you would have had no idea that right. that was a problem. Right. I feel like there's a deeper message there related to equity. But... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is. I mean, I, I know that growing up in the North, you know, we think of we thought of really country people. I mean, unfortunately, the stigma is not very intelligent. Right. You think you come from we think everybody who has that really deep southern draw comes from Appalachia. Right. And right. there's there's no schools and they still walk on you know dirt pathways. It's kind of like the same thing when you think about a third world country. Right. You don't think they have actually skyscrapers and they actually have a full economy. Right. Yes. Right. Full, right? Right. Full you know, the ignorance economy. is real in that in that scenario. Like my wife is from here. So when I first met her, one of the, well, for me, what was enduring was her her accent Um, like I was like oh my gosh she's got this sweet little country girl she sounds like a (laughs) you know like she came off somebody's farm Um, (laughs) but I mean completely opposite you know what I mean so and and I I, just one thing I I lived in um, Jersey City for a short period of time 
and they do. Um, Jersey folks, New York folks are really judgmental really quick, mm -hmm. right? But then once once the doors open, you know, floodgates, right? There wasn't nowhere on the block that we couldn't go. Stores would just let us in. I remember the laundromat would let Tia just come behind the, the counter and just take care of whatever they wanted. Oh. And, and the, Chinese, the Chinese restaurant, too, we used to go there so much. They'd be like, you just come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So that's cool. It's in going to New York for instance, you know, because L'Oreal's headquarters is in New York for the U.S. I spent a lot of time going there. And so then coming back home, right, to my client base, and they would be like, oh, what were you doing? And I was like, well, we were shooting this campaign or we were doing this educational video or whatever. And my clients were just like, oh, my God, what about New York and blah, blah, blah. And honestly, traveling there for 15, year, 15 16 years, I became like New York was the second home because when I went full time, I was there like almost every month if not more. And so it's really interesting, you know, when you when you start going there and you start as a Southerner where everything's a little slower, everything's a little, everybody's kind, you know, they open the door, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, you know, bless your heart kind of thing. Being in New York, the first time I was on the street, I remember, because back then, I don't know if I had a cell phone that had a map on it. The first time I went to New York, I, I think I had to like look it up somehow. But anyway, I remember I left like almost an hour earlier, like an hour early to go like three blocks because I was so worried that I was going to get lost or something was going to happen. But going there, I became so attuned to that culture. So now like me being here, I get into that zone of kind of being in New York yeah. because I don't pay attention a lot. You know, I work with headbuds quite a bit in my ears and, you know, don't pay attention. So I'm trying to like bring back some of that midwest southern kind of feel slow, because yeah. it's it's it is important and we don't need to be in a hurry yeah you know new yorkers <laughs> new yorkers would disagree with you but and it's not new yorkers are not mean people they're just focused you well, know like, and one of the truths that we have told um about southern indiana is yes polite all day so kind on the outside but what that hides is the covert mm -hmm. discrimination, yep. the covert judgment. And sometimes, as Miguel has said, it's better to know. So I'd rather have someone just be blunt and upfront right. and right. abrupt with me right. than have to find out, you know. Right. They're going to lynch me tomorrow. <laughs> well, or that they've been sabotaging and, and stepping in the way of people. You know, Absolutely. that's real. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned that you found your way to Leadership Southern Indiana, which for those who don't know, can you talk a little bit about yeah, what that does? Absolutely. So Leadership Southern Indiana, we are a community nonprofit. So we're a C3. Our focus, the organization was created in 1981. And what's really interesting is 1981 is the year I was born. So last year or a year ago when we celebrated our 40th anniversary as an organization, I was like, it's my 40th birthday. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, but community nonprofit that's focused around uh, leadership, de leadership development within our community. So we are, our mission and our purpose is to engage and mobilize regional leaders to impact the community. And I just want to talk about too, because what we do is community leadership, which has a number of different, you know, meanings, thoughts, whatever. But our biggest thing is we, you know, we focus on bringing people in, sharing the community so they can then see what is out there. And then from there, once their experience is completed, they then know, oh my gosh, I want to work with this organization or I want to sit on this board or maybe they feel inclined to run for office or whatever it may be. But our our thing is just to show how wonderful of a community that we have and how many people that are out there doing work to help other people is just, it's incredible to me. Um, and that's that's the biggest reason why I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. I went through Discover. I was a Discover graduate in 2021. Um, it, it was a life-changing experience for me. The pandemic was going on. We were all locked at home. So my experience wasn't the full Discover experience. But when we were together as a group, we were so happy and so excited to be together. It was kind of our outlet to get out. Yes. I So I um, also went through Discover. And I will say... I knew a lot of people, so I, I didn't think I needed the connection or I didn't need the um, networking opportunities that Discover just naturally brings you. Really, any Leadership Southern Indiana program brings you. But I was shocked about how much happened outside of my industry that I did not know. Um, because again, we are very siloed. We're busy doing our own business that we don't see how many things are happening in our backyard. So Discover does a great job of, of shedding light on that. And to me, 
leadership is specifically influence. So as a leader, I influence others and those leaders influence others. And so to me, like a key piece to leadership is influence, especially community leadership. I want Southern Indiana to be better when I'm done. You know, I want Southern Mm -hmm. Indiana to be like, wow, I never had this perspective or I didn't know this or I, and that's where the diversity and inclusion piece comes in. That's a huge focus for me as specifically inclusion. And, and it's, and it's something that, you know, we all hear these words mm-hmm. and what drives me crazy is, is people, you know, everybody wants to focus on diversity. You know, we got to diversify this, we got to diversify that. And that's all good and great, but truly in order to change and impact people in a community, it's about having the diversity, but then it's having that person be at the table and then say, what can you bring to help us understand what's going on in your community or in your world to make life better for others like you in Southern Indiana? So it's almost as if you are suggesting that just diversifying spaces or diversifying workspaces is not enough. Correct. That you need to make sure that you create a safe space so people can have voice and be heard. Correct. Can you talk about how you think some either leaders or businesses um, conflate the two? Sure. I think a lot of times, you know, specifically different areas, whether it be boards or companies or whatever, will have that diversity checklist. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have female representation? Do we have black or brown representation? Do we have LGBTQI plus representation? And in some spaces, people do that. And it's, you know, what it is, it It aggravates me because, again, for me, it's more about the inclusion piece. So don't just do it from a checkbox standpoint. Do it from a place of we have discovered that in our organization, business, whatever, that we do not have diversity. And it's not going to be about us just checking a box so we can see it in a picture. But it's also about saying, how can we impact that specific individual's community with what we do? Because it's all circular right? You bring someone in, they impact and empower and push for one specific part of the company. That's going to pay off for that organization in the long run because people are going to see that and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, they really are listening. They really are doing to be able to, you know, help people get what they need or see a different perspective or even have change in any number of ways. So, so would you say that your overall perspective, Southern Indiana is a diverse and inclusive community? I can't say, I I can't say that it's totally that way. No, I, I, I think we still have opportunities for growth. One of those ways being it's, we need to create spaces for conversations because And I'm going to speak to this from a human being standpoint, because so many times, so many other things get involved in this conversation, but I'm speaking as a human being to other human beings. It's so important for us to pay attention to what other human beings needs, desires, wants, whatever it may be to make the community cohesive in that in that way, right? Those times that you get to sit across from another human being and you get to hear their suffering, you get to hear the stories of the challenges of what they go through on a daily basis. That's when change starts to happen within someone. Because then from that moment forward, when they're walking on and they're looking at somebody who's a member of the LGBTQI plus community, they are going to be like, oh, I remember John saying X, Y, and Z. So when I approach this particular situation the next time in their mind, hopefully they approach it differently because of something that I shared with them. And we all are human beings. We all share this space, right? We live in America. America is home of the free, right? And so it's so important for us to support and love and respect other people in their ability to do that and to live their life and be better. We do have a lot of challenges, not just in Southern Indiana, but as as a whole, there, there's a lot of challenges. But I believe, I really, really believe that this young generation of people that are coming up is going to be the difference that's going to start shifting things in really big ways. You know, they're just, they're just so inclusive just in who they are. They're not scared to have conversations. They are armed with a little computer at their fingertips that they can look up facts at any given moment. 
So in, in a country, city, state, county mm-hmm. that is typically governed by laws both mm-hmm. and rules, both right. written and unwritten, right? how do you see moving beyond a conversation? I Honestly, I believe that if enough of us have a conversation, that conversation shifts into change and action, and then that action then shifts into other momentums that keep going right so it, i don't think we're we're not going to solve the, any issues overnight but we all have to mentally and in our heart be aware of this so that moving forward we're all supporting and helping one another get to the goals of whatever that community or peace part of a community whatever it may be needs and so i call on i call on people to listen not only with their mind but listen with their heart and really focus on the human being element of it don't focus on anything else focus on being a human being to another human being and just really get in there by having those conversations though i believe it starts the process and every conversation every single conversation will shift into something great if both sides of that conversation are coming to it from a human being element and with an open mind and an open heart of how can I be a better neighbor? What can I do for others in my community? Because that's what being a leader is to me, is serving people, you know? And not every person that I come in contact with in this community is gonna be on the same path as I am. But that doesn't mean that I can't give them the same love and respect that I would want have given to me. Right. And I believe it's through those actions. That's what continuously changes people over time. It's a constant battle and it will be for a while. I I truly believe that. But, you know, in my own personal way, I keep working. I keep showing up. I keep doing what I'm doing because I believe that eventually we'll get to a place to where we won't have issues like we've been having in the last six months i was like <laughs> probably that we are currently um, yes, having yes, yes, yeah yes. i mean and, and i'm curious about that yeah. you know you know where and, and you can choose like i don't have right. a position yet i haven't right. you know but indiana passes bill what is it i can't I sb 150 sb 150 no well that's right that's kentucky, kentucky. 480 SB 480. Mm-hmm, 480 and and so thinking about you know transgender lgbtq anti-legislation that is hitting across the country but focused right here you know, what is the leadership in our community doing, right, to bring inclusion and equity and, and, right. and diversity in that space? Well, and safety so that this to this doesn't those kids. happen. Like, right. we literally just had a governor sign a bill right. who said, I don't believe in it, don't really know what it is, and it's as clear as mud. Right. But you know what? It's going to, f- but that bill is going to affect a lot of people's lives. Yeah. So, and I'm going to speak to this from my leadership standpoint, right? The main thing that I can do right away, because as one person, you can't necessarily go somewhere and change, you know, a whole group of people's laws or whatever it is that they're doing, you know, putting together. But the one thing that I can do is I can help families, moms, dads, whoever it is of trans kids, be able to have a space to come together to figure actions out of what they need, right? I can do that myself. Any leader within this community who knows someone who has a trans child who's going through these difficult conversations or whatever may end up happening with the situation is giving them the space to be able to talk. Being the fighter to go in and say, okay, right now we're not meeting anywhere. There's no anything happening. Let's get into the, let's get into the organizations. Let's find the spaces that will welcome this group in to be able to just sit together, have conversations, let their kids be together. That's how I as a leader can change and in effect and do. And then hopefully through my actions and through my support and love for other human beings, right? Other leaders hopefully see that as well too. And it inspires them to do something similar because I individually can't do anything, but what I can do is give space, is give space, encourage conversations, you know, make connections with mental health resources, whatever it may be to get in there and to at least give a space so people can be together so that those that are going through these difficult times can have a space to be able to support one another. And so, but my hope is by doing that, other people see that and other people start to soften those perspectives and start to say, I need to be involved, or I need to help, or my neighbor's kid, or my nephew, or my niece, or my own child, whatever it is. But they just hopefully will take a step to do something different, or to make a different, you know, to have a a different thought process, or a different, you know, mentality about it. That's what I hope. 
anyway. So two things I'm hearing you say. First, we can't do these things in a closet. We can't, we have to be open and and vocal about the things that we are doing in the community and what the community needs. Absolutely. Um, So that takes bravery, like you talked about before. But number two, um, I wanted to mention, we've had this conversation, you and I, and Rachel, if you've listened to our episode with Rachel Klein Palmer, um, who has a trans kid, we, the three of us have had this conversation and we are hoping to move towards that action step that you mentioned, because again, at some point you have to go from conversation to action, but where you do sit in a place of power and privilege that you can enact change in this way. So do you want to speak about that? Yeah. I, you know, again, you know, I, I have a lot of, in, in, in leadership, I have a lot of influence, right? And I take my influence very seriously. So when I'm connecting or meeting or working with people throughout the community, that influence that I have is very sacred to me, right? It's my brand. It's my name. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, it's about showing up and doing the work. And I'm going to say that again, show up and do the work because nothing drives me more crazy. We're in, we're in this time where everybody's a keyboard warrior, you know, is behind a phone or a keyboard and they're like going after somebody on a social media platform or TikTok or whatever. Like we all just need to stop doing that and actually show up and do the work for our community, no matter what it is that you're working for, show up and do the work. Mm -hmm. So I think the action part of that starts with showing up and doing the work. You know, when I ran into to you both in the coffee shop and we were having this initial conversation, you know, I immediately heart sank right on the inside, started feeling the emotion of, oh my gosh, like people are being affected by this. I don't know. I don't know what I can do, but what I can do is I can help you find a space to be able to get together as parents, be together, connect and go through that. I can tap into the mental health community that I have to be able to provide mental health support for the families, for the kids, whatever it may be. So that's hopefully my first step of action, Mm -hmm. I'll say, Mm -hmm. and, you know, going from there. But I, I, I really feel like as, as leaders, we, we owe it to ourselves to be, to be better for our community and influence the right ways and influence in the right areas to be able to actually enact change and get people to see things from a different perspective and help, help people love, you know, love, learn and grow in a different way. I'm curious. And, and again, I'm, I wonder, like, I know there's a stigma in the black community when it comes to LGBT community, right? Mm-hmm. Some some of my friends who are black and gay are like, I'm gay first and black second or right. whatever. So there's these conversations that we have privately. Right. You know, and in, in the role that you play, do you see a separation between those in the African-American or brown community that are gay versus, you know, white folks that are gay? And, you know, is it harder to go into black communities sometimes? Or what, what does that look like in Southern Indiana? It, it is, you know, and, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm a cisgender white gay male, right? So I walk into a room and I'm not necessarily picked up on right away that I'm a gay man, right? Until I say something. And I truly believe that there is separation between the black and brown community in the gay community and the white gay community. And it's interesting to me because we're all fighting for the same thing. But that separation comes from whatever it may be. I truly don't know what causes that separation. But what I can say is that at the end of the day, for for me anyway, is when I go into a black or brown community, I try to be extremely sensitive, not only from a gay perspective, because I think sometimes in a lot of black men's, you know, growing you know, in their homes with their families, I think it sometimes is less accepted by by black and brown families than it is white families. And I'm not sure why that is. But when I go in, I try to understand and support that aspect, knowing that there may be a lot of challenges that, you know, somebody might not be out yet, might not be open yet, whatever it may be. I try to approach it that way and try to be sensitive and understand that they're not at that time in their life yet. That doesn't mean that they won't be. But in, in the gay world, anything LGBTQI+, you have to meet people where they are in that moment, in that time. And so many, I like, I really hate labels. Labels drive, drive me crazy because I believe that's what creates separation. You know, you're gay, you're straight, you're black, you're white. Like, I, I just wish that we all looked at each other just as human beings, like I keep saying. And I use that a lot. But, you know, for me, it's, I don't know, I just... 
I just try to look at people as human beings. I try to be respectful of their of their situation, but also knowing that as a white cisgendered gay male, I can walk into a room and be undetected. Whereas, you know, in the black community, I think sometimes, you know, it tends to be looked at probably as people are a little more like sissy or feminine or whatever. And so it creates that no, I'm a man, you know, I'm a man, I'm not going to be that. I don't want to be open about it because of whatever. And I just try to support those conversations and help those folks. I, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but it's one of those things for me that, you know, actually my, my first, I shouldn't say that I don't have that much experience with it because my first relationship as a teenager in high school was with a black man or a black you know, guy um, that I went to school with. And I went to a predominantly white high school and there was maybe like five or six black kids there. And so it was even more important that our relationship was kept very quiet because he was an athlete. He was into all these things. So it was very important for us to keep it quiet, keep it, you know, kind of separate or away from people finding out or knowing because I think the black community can be harder on, especially men, I think, if they come out or, you know, they talk about their sexuality in some way. It's very, it's almost kind of a very discreet culture. And I don't know if you, I don't know if, if you have experience with that, but it's, it's, a, it seems to be a very discreet culture. Like there's not a lot shared or talked about necessarily. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stigma. I mean, church, you know, it's, is really big. Definitely when you talk about people who are kind of diehard Christians and, mm-hmm. and, and that belief and, and that can come, can can definitely disrupt mm-hmm. right um relationships you know and and i thought it was interesting when you said your your dad was you know southern baptist and i was mm-hmm. like man that's got to be an interesting dynamic because mm-hmm. i know in the black community that would extremely that would definitely be mm-hmm. an interesting dynamic mm-hmm. i know um my mom's my mom's third husband when she was married a third time you know came out as gay after you know a period of time but i, I know that he was ostracized from his family mm-hmm. at one point and his father was a pastor right yep. and so th- there is that um and it's consistent i can't speak to it cuz i'm not i'm not a gay man uh-huh. in that space but i've i've seen enough of it to question and wonder uh-huh. and and like i've said in other shows like this is a new conversation for me right yeah. um it's yeah. not one we get to have often you know, and, and even even strangely, like one of my best friends in high school was gay. We knew he was gay, mm-hmm. but he would never say he was gay. Right. And, you know, understanding today what I know, I know why he wouldn't have said anything. Right. You know, he later comes out when, we're, you know, we're full ass adults mm-hmm. and he comes out and he says, hey, by the way, I'm gay. And I remember when he called me and I laughed and he was like, what's funny? I was like, dude, we always knew. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm glad you finally figured it out. Right. But I also understand culturally what that means in, in certain communities. We played football, right. basketball, you know, right. we were supposed to be this machismo thing right. in these spaces. I also, his dad um, was from Alabama. Um, this is a white family, so he he was a really strong person from Alabama, and we'll just leave it there. Uh-huh. So I'm sure that took some shift, considering I was probably the first black person to ever come in their house. Right. Um. And so you know, so yeah, I I, I yeah. definitely I definitely imagine there's a great deal of stigma. Some of the conversations we have, and I, I often wonder, you know, where does it come from? Right. Right. Um. All of it. Right. Because it's there's a consistency, but it is. I mean, you know, it, in stigma happens, you know, a lot with gay men. You know, it's, it's, you know, and in the gay world, you, you hear a lot of gay men specifically speak to themselves as uh, like mask or masculine, right? Okay. So they will define themselves as a gay man, as being a masculine gay man. They're not a, you know, flamboyant, you know, person. And it's, it's interesting to me because I never really look at that within people, men, women, uh, like I just look at people as whether I have good energy with them. If I have a good flow or a good feel, right? But I think a lot of gay men really want to hold on to that masculinity and that butchness, if you were to say, because they don't want to ever be labeled as, you know, flamboyant or girly or sissy or whatever it may be. You know, I mean, my mom will tell you about me growing up. She always knew I was different. She'll tell you I was sensitive. I was artistic. You know, I always wanted to be involved in anything, hair, fashion, or makeup. You know, I was all about all of that. And so she knew and she could see me struggling, you know, trying to be in a world where, you know, I'm with all these, you know, macho country guys, which still to this day are some of my best friends in the entire world talk to them all the time, love them to death, fully supportive of me, have always been supportive. And it took a long time to get there because I didn't come out to them. They found out and that hurt a lot of them 
because I didn't share that. They knew I was gay, right? They knew I was different, but they, me not sharing that with them and talking to them about that, I think really hurt and impact a lot of them mm. because they were like, you were my best friend. You stayed at my house all the time. And and to me as a gay man, I'm thinking, well, that's why I didn't want to say anything. Because I want to continue because, to stay at your house. Right, <laughs> because I wanted to be your friend, you know? And it's, that's the fear that you grow up with as a gay person and it still continues even into adulthood because there are situations i mean happens all the time it happens all the time here in southern indiana i will meet people and if i say something my partner my husband my boyfriend whatever terminology i use i can see the look on their face you know and it's like <laughs> you know i'm like i'm like come on now you know i'm I, i'm no different right i was the same person 5 seconds ago that i because, am like, now that you know gay doesn't define me gay is a part of who i am i am me first and foremost i'm not i'm I, i'm not gay first i'm me first i'm i'm the one with the heart the mind all of these things i just happen to want to be in a relationship with another man that doesn't make anything it doesn't it doesn't make a difference in anything it's just a part of who you are one of the things that you said I want to go back to you mentioned hating labels and just seeing people as people but I also in the same breath I've heard you say but I recognize what they bring to the table that you know I have to be more sensitive around a black gay person because I know that they are coming with a certain level of baggage possibly or in the black community knowing that they may they have a different because again as a cis white man you know that your struggle has been different than theirs so while you hate those labels you are still able to see the full person there and I think that that's the important thing because it almost you know people talk about I want to be colorblind blah, blah, blah. but when you are colorblind you are not seeing the full humanity because you don't know what that full, that person has brought to the table right. so I really respect that while you still want to see person as a human first um, you are seeing everything that they bring and all of the possible you know baggage is not the right word but the struggles and the battles that they have fought to even be in that space I think for instance not seeing a person as black also doesn't see how the world treats them every day. If I if I choose not to see, right. a, you know, color in someone, which is not a real thing, P.S., then I, I also don't get to see the fullness of that person's experience that they bring. Yeah, and it's, you know, you know, for me, it's it's sitting and hearing stories and talking to people and learning about people that bring that sensitivity and that awareness there. Because while I want to live in a world that doesn't have labels, that doesn't see color, that doesn't see any of those things, we live in a world that does that, right? And the way that I as a leader can impact that is by having people share their stories, having people share uncomfortable parts about their past, because it's through those moments of emotion that stir that inside of someone that makes them see something differently. And mm -hmm. I, I live with a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion. You know, I do a lot in the community. You know, I'm a part, I'm, I'm one of the board of directors on the Southern Indiana Pride Festival. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work with the Jeffersonville Public Art Commission. I work with the Arts Alliance um, here in Southern Indiana. And I serve all of these because they make our community better, you know? They do. Like, you know, Public art, to me, in any expression, is one of the most important things that we can do because art, to me, evokes emotion. When you walk up to it and you see it, like when I walked into your studio and see all of your beautiful pictures and the the fashion expression and the the, the raw edge to a lot of it, it just, it in me, it just automatically ignites this just like, I want to be here, like I want to stay here, you know? <laughs> and that's what art, art does for me. But it's serving and it's listening and it's showing compassion and showing love and respect to, to other people through service. And, you know, in, anytime you're around me, you will hear me say a thousand times, show up and do the work. Quit talking about it. Quit mm -hmm. just giving money. Money's a great thing and it does a lot of things. But when you're working with a community that, that wants you to see or understand something differently, it's not until you show up and do the work that you really understand what that community needs, right? Or what is actually there that's a problem or a challenge. Because through the work, that's how you see it. And so I encourage people all the time, uh, you know, in a lot of our programs, we do serve projects, we do many things. And that's because I want our leaders to show up and do the work and see that actually them packing, you know, 75 treat bags for the homeless 
in southern indiana makes the biggest difference ever because while to us it's 35 bucks for like a package of like you know chips or crackers or whatever it is when you put those in a bag and then at the end of it they write a little note you know saying something like i hope this makes your day better and puts it in that bag and when that person picks that bag up and is sitting there you know could potentially be the only food that they have for a week or whatever you know and then they get to that card and they open that little card and they see you know i hope this makes your day better and hopefully through that act of service and doing that it does change. It does make a difference. So, yeah. And I would say even packing the bags helps bring awareness. I know when we do that as a family, it causes our kids, because we keep them in the car, to look for people that the culture and that the world prefers to make invisible. So they're looking for people on the margins. Yep. And if you have those bags in your car after you've packed them, you start to look at the world in a different way. So it's not just the giving, it's the act of seeing the world differently. Yeah. Yeah. And just being respectful, kind, loving people, doing things for the purpose of bettering our community. Because listen, we all share this space. We all are here, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And I want you and you and every neighbor that I have to have the best life possible. And the way we do that is we change what's happening in Southern Indiana, yes. right? And we continue to push for that change to make everybody's life here possible. Because the better of a community that we have economically, we pull in companies that want to base here, that then bring their workers here, that then bring their money here, mm -hmm. that then bring their tax dollars here, which then in turn change our roads, our playgrounds, our park, everything possible. Everything that we want to do will come here. And I've seen Southern Indiana since I've lived here. I've lived here for seven years, eight years now. I have seen it change drastically because I believe, even though we still have some opportunity, I think it's one hell of a community and I've never seen groups of people that show up and work harder for each other than I have here. I've, we have some of the most amazing nonprofit organizations that serve and help and selflessly do all of the things that they do. We have great companies, great businesses, great business resources. We have everything. Even this, you guys are started this podcast to enact change mm -hmm. and to drive conversation and tell stories. And stories is what is our history, but it's also what changes us for the future. I completely agree. I do want to point out, though, that yes, we want companies to come here. We want companies to feel safe and able to come here. But like we mentioned in the last episode, if we keep passing these laws that make people unsafe, large companies will leave. So legislators, just something to think about. We need to make people feel safe in this state. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Make everybody feel safe. John, thank you for coming and sharing with us. It has been amazing. I really appreciate your story. I want to know more. I wish we had more time so you can come back and do this <laughs> yep, again. Absolutely. You should definitely come to one of the panel discussions. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Marley, Missy. Friend. We out of here. We're done. Oh, Yo, this is your boy, Gelly Gel. This is Missy Smith. Bye, friends. This is Common Conversations. We'll holla at you next show. Peace, love, and hair grease.